This is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. We're here in our Fountainhead Studios on Westwood Drive here um, in Port Coquitlam. We're on the unceded territory of the Coquitlam First Nations. And part of our coverage is for the municipal 2022 election, which of course election day is October 15th. And today we have uh, Councillor uh, Glenn Pollock in the studios from Port Coquitlam. Welcome, Councillor. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Port Coquitlam is changing a lot. There's a, uh, folks who are been around for a while, definitely know you. We see you yeah. everywhere. But if I was just new to town and just sort of came in and uh, there's an election coming and wants to know more about uh, Councillor Pollock, what would that be? Uh, I've uh, lived in the city for 41 years, Patrick, and, uh, and it's amazing that you mentioned that about uh, the city changing. I Every time election t rolls around, I phone my friends that... Uh, that I maybe haven't talked to in a few years, and oh, we live in Maple Ridge now, or we live in Pitt Meadows. We sold the house and bought an apartment. So, uh, so uh, yeah, it is uh, it is a changing community. Uh, uh, my uh, background initially was in uh, in sports. I was the president of uh, minor lacrosse at one time. I was on the Amateur Athletic Association, which is was the predecessor to the uh, Sport Alliance, Poco Sport Alliance. Coached hockey for 16 years. Coached lacrosse for 30 years. Still on the Junior A lacrosse executive. Um, uh, it's funny though how life is. Yeah, I got elected to council and, uh, and my interests changed. I'm still a big advocate for sport and recreation in the city, but uh, my big passion is housing and homelessness and, and poverty reduction. Uh, and that's, I work hard on that, but um, uh, worked at Safeway for 32 years. I now work for Mike Farnworth, the MLA in Polk was a constituent assistant. Uh, been married to my lovely wife Christine for 41 years. We have uh, we have three sons and and they're all happily married. And we have five beautiful grandchildren now. So uh, lived on North Side for 22 years and then downsized to Townhouse. Has been on South Side for the last 19 years. So got a little bit of both sides of town. So That's which good. is important. Yeah, I grew up on the North Side and married a South Side girl. So there I, you go. I kind okay. of feel like yeah. a, and you have to live on the <laughs> South Side. Literally therefore. the other side of the tracks. Eh? <laughs> I was dragged over. I was recruited, as yeah. they say. Right on. So, so I, of course, you know, COVID is still here. I just had yeah. my fourth shot. Same uh, here. We're kind of in this, uh, is it here, is it not here? Yeah. But I know there's a point where it was what I call the panic of it's here. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't mention the word pandemic. It was the, the, the disease or, or that can't, couldn't be named. But just in the city of Port Coquitlam, for those who are obviously challenged through COVID, how did that um, impact you as well as as the city as, as a as a councillor? Well, it uh, it did. It, it, I didn't miss a day of work working for Mike. Uh, we just uh, we had a lot of safety protocols in the office. But um, the city, I think it uh, it affected you know everyone. I, I mean, we've um, God. This, you could Patrick. We could spend all day talking about this item alone. Uh, we, we, you know, we were, we're, we're uh, underserved, I think, our community for transit. We don't have SkyTrain. Uh, uh, COVID uh, allowed a lot of people to work from home, and it's, this is this new thing. And so to, uh, to bring people back into onto transit, back to work, they, they're not coming, I think, in the numbers we saw before. So that's a challenge, I think, for us. Um, people that, of course, there's some people that um, didn't want to get vaccinated. Uh, that's a challenge. We had issues at the new rec center with when we did reopen with people who didn't want to be vaccinated, couldn't come in the building. And on, on that note, we were just um, following public health orders, right, of the provincial government, which I, I'm full of, I just got my fourth vaccine on, uh, on uh, Wednesday as well. So, uh, so, yeah, those are the challenges. I mean, there was challenges with the staffing. Uh, a lot of people were laid off, and we've had a heck of a time getting people back qualified uh, rec, uh, weight room assistants and, and trainers and stuff and qualified lifeguards. It's been a struggle. So that's, and we we had one gentleman who kept emailing the city and said, they, that can't still be an issue. And we're going, yeah, it's still an issue. There's not enough people. I don't know where everybody went, Patrick. I don't know what, where people found other jobs that maybe they were more comfortable with. It would get, was an opportunity for some. I, I, I think all the, the CERB and stuff has run out now. So that can't be the issue. But we, we had a hell of a time finding people to work in the buildings, so. Yeah, so, so uh, of course, you just hit that, uh, being a sports person, the, the PCCC, or how you, as the city calls it, but yeah. it's the new yeah. Port Coquitlam Community, Community, Community Center. Center. Even I have a trouble with that, the, yeah. the, one of the three Cs. Yeah. But as, as a, you, from the beginning of the idea to now actually seeing it finished, how did, how did that feel? That feels amazing, actually, because it's, you know, we get, uh, we get our uh, arc, architect's renderings for buildings that are going in Poco, and you look at it, wow, that's just beautiful and look at how grand it is and then when it's built it's this little box and you go that does not what I recall from from the art and you know that's not that common but it, it's happened sometimes but that building that PC, C is exactly what we 
what the developers told us we were going to get the builder Ventana. They said, here's what we're going to design. And they, cause it, we, we told them what we wanted. We went out, we did a, a, a design build. We, we went out and we had a number of um, companies respond to us. And uh, they said, here's what we're going to build. And, and it's turned out exactly what the, the, I think it's so striking. The uh, glue lambs, the wooden beams that run through the, the building, uh, the grand corridor there where there's a coffee shop at one end and a restaurant at the other. And you can, that's supposed to be, they called it a bumping place. And it's totally turned into that. I, every time I go there, I run into somebody in that big corridor, I, I know. And I go there, I go to the gym there three or four days a week. And I see the same people coming out of the pool. And I went, the other day I went late on Tuesday because I had something in the morning. I generally go at seven in the morning. I went around 11 and it was packed. There was Zumba classes going. There was a yoga class going and there was, it was just unreal. So it's just, it's turned out exactly how I, I anticipated. So. And, and I guess, uh, you know, one of the things you've got lacrosse, we've got the extra rink. So you've yeah. got lacrosse folks that can, you know, there's sort of the sense of always waiting for hockey to end. Yeah. And you yeah. know, hockey sometimes yeah. has to end early. So, so I, I, you know, that extra rink is great. Uh, I think public skating is open uh, yeah. pretty well more yeah. than it was before. But yeah. it's almost like the minute you build it, then people want more resources. Yeah, yeah, that, so it's kind of hard, I guess. That's been a bit of an issue. We, we still probably need to build a, a cover the cross box. One woman that's involved in hockey uh, said we could have built ten rinks, and if we yeah. don't, uh, if we don't uh, watch closely who's in them, uh, it, it'll be you know everybody from all over the lower mainland will be in there. But uh, yeah, I that was Dean Watch and I were very strong, had very strong opinions about building that third sheet. That it was uh, we wanted ice out of there early, like in late February, to get the kids in to, to, to for tryouts for lacrosse because it's so frustrating when you. You're trying to run tryouts and it starts pouring rain on you in the lower mainland as it's known to do. And Patrick, if you don't mind, there's one more thing I want to mention. I I was I didn't mention in the PC P triple C was we we it, the the building turned out exactly as we thought. But I have to give staff so much credit because that back area, there's a community garden, there's pickleball courts, there's two playgrounds, one for the daycare and one for the community. There's a big open lawn area where, I don't know if you've been to any, we had a, a couple of festivals there so far. And then the Terry Fox Hometown Plaza is just, it's just amazing what they've done, what staff have done back there. And, and I think it's phenomenal. So. Yeah, I think the farmer's market's in that. Yeah, in that plaza. plaza. Yeah, it's yeah, awesome. So yeah, It's, it's kind of like yeah. connecting it all and then the parking. Yeah, I mean, yeah I underground know. parking's been a... So, yeah. And, so, so when you look at that, uh, I mean, I mean, for like, as a lacrosse person, that must yeah. be kind of, I mean, I mean, they haven't named one of the rinks after you yet, but it's, 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 <laughs> it's, really it's kind of like, at least you say that's my stamp on, 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 yeah, on this yeah, city, yeah, so. yeah. I'm very proud of that we added, cause that was a heck of a fight to be honest with you at the time was to not only add the third floor or sheet, but to make sure it was a full functioning, not a, cause there was, uh, you know, some members of council and not criticizing, they had their opinion and they're entitled to it, but we had a difference of opinion. There was some that wanted to put a leisure ice in there, which is, you know, a half size or reduced size, or there's one in Langley, I think, Langley or Abbotsford that has a fireplace mm. on one side of it. And it, it, you know, you can't use something like that for hockey or lacrosse. So we kind of, you know, try, uh, you know, gave in a bit to that discussion to have the fireplace, the two side fireplace in the middle of the one corner of, uh, or in the corner of one rink. Uh, you know, you walk in the lobby and it's on your, on your left, if you come in the main doors, and that is two sided, it faces the rink. So, at Christmas or, the, you know, Thanksgiving or whenever, when there's public skating and there's functions in there, there may be festive functions. We can have the fireplace going and stuff. So, so we've had the Giants there. Yeah, I guess the uh, Abbotsford Canucks are coming next. Yeah, week. that's so, awesome. So that's kind of cool to have. Uh, I guess bi you know, bigger sport coming to town. That's yeah, it's amazing. Cool. And those the, and the, the screens in there and stuff for the replay boards are amazing. They you, you know can call up a team's logo on it and stuff. Yeah. So I know some folks when you went the, the the pool the way it is it sort of a, has a three lane pool and it's sort yep. of a paddling waiting area, you know and it's, it's, could you give us sort of the lot the, the thought process around that I know there's some investment made in Centennial Pool yep. so it was sort of like, I mean you can't build it for everybody so just just folks yep. out there about the pool and what was the decision making so that so that uh, and you'll forgive me if I don't have all the details but it the, the discussion so when we went into it we said here's my, how much room we got because we were very set on uh, on uh, building around the old rec center uh, which they do with schools now I don't know if you remember when they built Pitt, Pitt River Middle School it was that close to the old one right they built around it and it's just to to, to have no interruption of service we didn't want to have sports seniors anybody that uses that building have an interruption service so we said we'll build a new one and as we build around it we'll take the old one down so we had to, we only had so much room to deal with there was a suggestion of an elevated running track over one of the rinks. There was a suggestion of a climbing wall. We had all these things. We went back and forth and decided, you know, what to have in there. And we decided not to have a, a, a Lynx pool. We decided to have what we have. And, uh, and um, it was a conscious decision, but it was, and it was one that was made grudgingly uh, 
because of the the the, the space con constraints. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, you know what? It's funny. I've won since um, COVID. I think there's been two. I might have been one just before COVID, and I went to one since. I, uh, Councilor McCurr and Councilor Darling and I went to a big meet. Uh, Brandon Connolly, the president of Polka Marlins, invited us to meet, and uh, they tell me they have the fastest pool in British Columbia, and I go. <laughs> what makes a pool fast, right? But I guess the troughs where the water drops off, they're so deep and keeps the water calm and they have the best up-to-date starting things. And he said it's the fastest pool in British Columbia. So they're sad. They're, you know, we just we did that, did upgrades to the pool and added the new dressing rooms there. So they're thrilled with it. So I, I think it worked out for everyone. Is it perfect? No, but you know, you don't want perfect being the enemy of good. And I think it's great even that we've done there. So. So I know in Poco, was lots of, uh, you know, safe streets was a big thing. Uh, yeah. And I mean, we were talking safe streets. We're talking about pedestrian safety. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I mean, we're seeing the, a few things that are being added to the city in the last four years. Yeah, we, we're doing, uh, we've been doing, well, in the last, beyond four years, we've been doing it for eight years, I think, adding curb bulges and, uh, and elevated uh, crosswalks, which everybody calls them speed bumps. They're actually elevated crosswalks and uh, flashing pedestrian lights. And uh, I think they're all... Necessary and and uh, just even straight up street lighting. We had a uh, uh, my street Hawthorne. My wife and I live in a townhouse on Hawthorne Avenue, and right at the corner of Hawthorne and Shaughnessy, I had a, a neighbor complain, say, you know, have you ever noticed how dark it is there at night? And I walk there all the time because I walk from City Hall to home because it's only like a six minute walk, and I hadn't noticed. And so we added a, a, a light standard right there. So even that that so you can't do enough of that, Patrick. We get a, we we've got we've got a city budget that we uh, we try to spend some on you know everything. And uh, and uh, we uh, we just need to keep spending money every year on on traffic safety, pedestrian safety, because it's a huge issue. So a big um, before we get onto your favorite topic was affordable housing. We, yeah, we've got a whole bunch of other things happening. We got the yeah. Donald Walkway, McAllister, yeah. and yeah. and it goes, so if, just a quick update: what's happening there? Um, so we took a bit of heat in, on uh, removing some cherry trees in front of City Hall, but they were, in my opinion, and in, in the Arbus opinion, they were uh, end of life. Uh, and we wanted to open up. One thing we heard over and over again from residents whenever, whenever we did surveys was open it up. And it was especially around Remembrance Day. That's when people who maybe didn't come to Lee Square that often would come down there. And uh, so we're opening up. We did McAllister. We wanted to McAllister, um, widen the sidewalks in the pedestrian area so those, the restaurants and stuff on, on McAllister can have outdoor seating. And then we're going to open up uh, uh, Veterans Square and Lee Square to have more continuity between the two area so when you do have festivals down there uh it's easier to move around and you can see more of what's going on we again when we had any did any kind of survey with residents uh, we heard loud and clear have more festivals like whether it's uh craft brewery festivals whether it's uh uh food truck festivals all kinds of stuff but we you know we even had that McAllister street party i don't know if you I thought, yeah i saw you there that morning that was phenomenal i couldn't hang around that day very long it was the day i was picking my wife up from uh having hip replacement surgery but uh it was phenomenal. It was jammed with people. I saw people I hadn't seen in years there, so it was awesome. So that's uh, that's what we're doing there, and the, and the and the Donald Pathway, which we get people, you know, love that thing. I live in that neighborhood. Like say, walk my dogs there sometimes, and they love that. And that's going to kind of continue right meander right through downtown, and then over towards the uh, the foot, footbridge uh, on Maple there. So. Yeah. And you hit that thing on, on the trees, you know, obviously, you know, you cut down a tree, it's, yeah. it's a contentious yeah. issue. So, so how do you balance that in the city? What, what, what are we doing in the city to balance that? Uh, we're, for every tree they take down, we got a new uh, 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 tree bylaw that says, you know, when they take down a tree, they have to put one up or, or, or more than one up. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, trees are precious for sure. They do so much good in the community. They're finding now even that, you know, you plant boulevard trees, they, they, they extend the life of pavement. I mean, there's so many good things trees do and so you want to be very careful about when and why and how you take them down but uh we're uh we're planting trees as fast as we take them down and um and uh, there's you know i know there's you know a small tree isn't as good as a big tree for sure but they, they they'll grow into big trees and uh and uh you know I, I i always you always want to protect them when you can but we're, we've got a project that's um in you know coming forward on on westwood uh and it's uh two towers and it's it, I think it's the place to, to you, we need to put density because it's so close to transit and there's going to be a lot of trees taken down there, but th that uh, developer is going to pay to put trees up elsewhere in the city because they can't fit them all in that lot. And you know, I think there's going to be an opportunity on that. We're putting in a multi-use path on Kingsway. I think there's going to be, I think that should have a tree every 10 feet. Mm -hmm. So 
So, and of course, we had a, we had a few fires down down in Poco. I think we've. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's almost like so so. What is that when you see the pop up park, which which yep. replaced from yep. that burned down, and you're and you've got the construction where the old church used to be. Yep. So just explain to us uh, or clarify if you can how it happens. Is there a bylaw? Kind of conflict between a bur place burns down, you can't build something. I, I just always the one. Well, the one where Martha's was and where the church was and that on McAllister, that one got held up a long time, from my understanding, because there was six businesses in there. Those landlord, but there was six businesses, and one of them was lawyer, mm. and uh, they didn't, and they each had a different insurance, and and uh, so that way it can be very complicated. The one uh, where the pop up park is um, is uh, that's one landlord that owns that, and I think everything this side of um, of uh, Giggle Dam. So he's, I think he's just uh, waiting to take the next step. And in, in the meantime, he's let us use it for a pop up park, which is very popular. So um, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no bylaw that says what you can and can't do. Certainly, it's, there's zoning. But we've had people come to us in the past and say, you needed to, to demand they build something right now. And, it, and then the discussion became, well, what are, we, what are you going to get? You get another dollar store? Or like, we want to do this in a measured fashion so we get what we want, we want there. And uh, in that McAllister Street project, the city's going to have a couple of uh, 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 spots in that building because we own a parking lot there where, where formerly the church was. And so, uh, you know, I, 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 Dean Washington's led the charge on that. Dean, Councillor Washington's been the, the downtown guy. Like we have, uh, we're, we're, we're lucky to have uh, uh, portfolios. One of mine is, as you said, is, is housing. And I'm passionate about that. But Dean's really passionate about the downtown. He's grown up in Poco and he had a business downtown for many years and and he's been working with all the developers and the landlords and 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 and, uh, and uh, businesses down there to have a common vision and it's going to be fantastic and we've got we've got um, so much density now like if you walk from my from downtown to my place on Hawthorne you pass nothing but apartment buildings and it's great because it's it's fairly gentle density it's not towers it's four to six story buildings um, and so you know, all those people, if you give them more things like patina is super popular, like, you know, and and any good restaurants we, that we add downtown or, or places to go, I think will be successful because there's just so much population density down there. So. So we're going to talk about uh, affordability. Yeah. Uh, uh, just um, a few things have happened in Poco we've, from, our, from what we've seen on the updates with, a, with affordable housing. But just kind of that portfolio in the city and it being such a key thing for especially young folks uh, or, or, or income challenge folks yeah. in our community. Like, yeah. like what's happening there? So we've added, uh, we've got about f just under 500 units of truly, truly affordable housing uh, coming to the city. Uh, so years ago, I found out that uh, in 2013, I think it was, we had a, a committee called the Social Inclusion Committee, and we had a presentation uh, to that committee from the Tri-City Homelessness and Housing Task Group saying, did you know, and they had this, the numbers of how many homeless were in the Tri-Cities, but how many, it was, the one that really got me then, Patrick, was the, how many women and children were homeless, and, and there was only at the time, there was, um, uh, Coquitlam has Como Lake Gardens, I think it's called, that's uh, YWCA, uh, uh, development up on, on, on Como Lake. And then there's a place in the U.S. called Elizabeth Goundry House. And those are the only options for, uh, for homeless women. And uh, so I found out that we had a piece of property. That, when I say we, there was a piece of property on, uh, on Flint Street that had been um, uh, vacant for years. And I found out that it was owned by Metro Vancouver. So I started the process of uh, chasing down Metro Vancouver to see if we could put the affordable housing on that property. And we don't have time today to go through all the hoops I had to jump through with uh, a gentleman at uh, Metro Vancouver. But I got Sandy Burpee on board from the Tri-City Tri Homeless and Housing Task Group. And I got uh, Michael Hine from the Chamber of Commerce. And I got some church uh, people uh, uh, from the different denominations that uh, talked about the challenges of homelessness. And I got everybody in a room and said, here, there's a piece of property. And, and uh, long, long, long story short, uh, did a business case with the help of TL Housing Solutions and... Um, and now we've got, uh, in December, January of this year, they're going to open 83 units of affordable housing there with women-headed leases, um, 12 townhouses, and 71 apartments. And if you get the chance to drive by there, it's phenomenal. Like, we had a tour in there a while ago because the other good thing is there's going to be a daycare on the bottom floor. And now it looks like there's going to be either a doctor's office or potentially a community health centre down there, one or the other. And so we went and met with Fraser Health and the Division of Family Practice there uh, a, a few weeks back. To see, so they could see the space, which is phenomenal. They were over the moon about it. But um, we've got a tour of some of the apartments, and they're just beautiful. They're just there's this there's this 
uh, thought process that if it's subsidized or affordable housing should be Spartan. And this is not. They're beautiful suites. I, I if you drive by there, have a look up on the uh, southeast corner. They have wraparound decks go all around. There's a four-bedroom unit so families can age in place. And they have a wraparound deck, which is just, I think they're amazing units. So, so we've got that. Uh, right after that happened, I found out that at the time when I went through that process, I found out that uh, Metro Vancouver only had two pieces of uh, uh, vacant property in Lower Mainland. They're both in Poco. The other one is a block from my house. It's at Welcher and Reeve. I went to them and said, okay, I'm going to start on that one now. And they said, tap the brakes, Councillor Pollock. Hang on. Instead of that, why don't you become... I was appointed to the Metro Vancouver Housing Committee and they said, we're going to do it ourselves. So Metro Vancouver Housing, they were going to build a four-story building there and Mayor West and I went to bat and it's going to be five stories now and I think it's going to have 63 units of housing. And then the last one is, in, in currently, is Affordable Housing Society that operates a building over across on the Bottle Depot, kind of kitty corner of the Bottle Depot over on Kingsway. They bought all the property uh, to the east of them and they're building 300 units of brand new there. And then when they get that done, they're either going to tear down and replace the stuff that's there currently or just give it a whole, uh, like move people, potentially, I guess, move people in from the old one into the new one and then uh, and then upgrade those ones or, or, re or rebuild them. So so we're lucky to have all that go going and that's great, but that's a drop in the bucket. We uh, we I think something that should come forward is affordable home ownership, which has been done in, as close to Poco as Port Moody's done some. Uh, it's like almost a rent-to-own program or a... Or a, a, a program where somehow the land because that's the thing the thing that made the Atira successful is that we're renting that when I say we I'm sorry I'm not involved any longer because it's up and going and Atira is the operator but Atira is uh, renting the space from Metro Vancouver for a dollar a year for a 60 year lease a life of the building lease so that takes the the property out of the equation that's a big cost right well if you get that out of the equation then the rest is a lot easier so I think the city has uh opportunities where we could maybe put some property in and not give property but do the same thing a 60-year lease or something and maybe do some affordable home ownership where uh if, you know a young person who there's young people in this community patrick that have two good paying jobs i was talking to a friend of mine yesterday um he and his son and his wife are and are both eas and they both make good money but they can't scrape together a down payment so if you take that out of the equation and say okay here you're down you, you rent it for 10 years until you until your down payment has become your your or your rent has become your down payment yeah. or something like that. it's a lot more complicated than that but there's programs to do it bc housing has a has a program called the housing hub that, that'll do that so um but we i was waiting to push that i was till we got our housing needs assessment staff asked me not to push that till we got our housing needs assessment done and it's um i believe i might be wrong in the numbers but i think they said we're building about 300 units a year in Polk and we, don't, we need to be building 500 units a year. Yeah. So we need to up the ante there. And uh, I, I, we do that by, I think, adding, uh, you know, more duplexes, uh, along with more smaller lot developments, expanding that and, you know, uh, delegating authority. We delegated authority to staff to do uh, coach houses. And I think we need to develop, uh, to delegate a lot more to staff. And just, and just, you know, when you talk about that, the, the Intera, which you were part of, I mean, you, one of the things is a good story. Oh, at the same awesome time, story. but at the same time, you're saying there's like 250 applicants. Uh, yeah, Atira sort of had uh, right? had uh, there's like I said, there's 83 units in there, and Atira had two oh, two. When they cut off the applications, they had 250 applications, and they could have taken more. And so, it just shows you how great the demand is, Patrick. Yeah. So, so just uh, I mean, because you're hearing all this about uh, you know David Eby, his housing, yeah. his housing plan. You're, you're a councilor that's 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 passionate about affordability, yeah. which which. Uh, uh, I haven't asked you a definition of affordability, but what does that what does that mean to you? To me, the, the the buildings that why I call these buildings truly affordable is most of them. Some of them will have really deep subsidies, and and that that's tough to do. But most of them will have uh, it's called RGI, rent geared to income. So there, for instance, there's a uh, there's people would be staggered to know how much affordable housing we have that was already in place. There's an organization called Forty Three Housing that's run by Share, and most of theirs is RGI, rent geared to income. And what it is is you pay one third of your your household income towards your rent. Yeah. And uh, you, they'd base that on your previous year's T4. Yeah. So that's, you know, I mean, I, I know uh, a woman that lives in one of those buildings that, that brings in about 1200 a month on uh, income assistance. So 400 bucks a month is her shelter allowance. Yeah. And, so yeah. so I, I, I guess it's just a chance to sort of let people know, like, you've got yourself, you know, you're hearing sometimes, you know, from the province that, you know, municipals aren't inter municipalities aren't interested. You're just telling us a story where you get involved and want to build these things. Yeah. Um, what 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 do we need to do, uh, or what do you think needs to be out of the way 
for you to do uh, give more affordable housing in Poker Lake? What, what's the, what's the missing piece? You think it's 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 well the willingness on the one hand, uh, yeah. the awareness I guess. Uh, so many cities. Uh, Patrick, Poco isn't one of them. We don't have a ton of, of, of property just laying around. Uh, people think the city owns all kinds of land. We don't all own all kinds of land. Some cities do. I think cities need to be more willing to take that land and put it towards uh, uh, affordable housing. And, and uh, like we, some of the land we do have, like this one piece of property I'm aware of, that that's where I want to put this uh, affordable home, owner, home ownership. If I, if I get the, you know, if, depending on the, the new council, depending if, depending if I'm there, I mean, like, knock, knock wood, I hope to be there and uh, on October 16th, but uh, if I'm not, I'll certainly uh, pressure uh, the you know members of council that are there to to pursue this affordable home homeownership. But it, again, it's a drop in the bucket, and uh, I think it's 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 willingness and it's it's uh, awareness of the, of the things we can do. I think the housing announcements at Minister Eby, and you know what, I was critical of him. He was criticizing us, but that affordable uh, affordable. Housing Society Development on Kingsway, it sat at the province for just under a year waiting for an environmental approval. A year. And we were ready to go on it. So, and he knows that. I've sent him emails and I've been told he reads every one of his emails. So, but the, the sweeping changes he's uh, suggested if he becomes premier are, are going to do a ton to, to, to accommodate affordable housing. So, and, and for me, this is just, you know, my opinion. I mean, you're, you've coached, I've coached, yeah. and, and you talked about kids you know. It's just, you know, when we're talking about Poco and sort of this, oh, this, yeah. this continual, you know, yeah. legacy of, you know, sort of other families yeah. and other folks, it just feels like this affordable housing is, is impacting that, in my view. Like, you've yeah. got kids who are making, you know, so-called livable wage yeah. and getting livable hours of that wage to yeah. people, and they're having trouble even finding yeah. a place yeah. to buy. It's so, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So... Do we you need to solve that somehow, Patrick. Yeah. 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 Do you think there's a disconnect, though? Do you think sometimes people, because you, you know, if you're sort of like me, sitting in your house and did nothing, and all of a sudden you have value in your assets, yeah. you're kind of like, it's almost disconnected. I think. Sometimes. I think so to some degree. Uh, we don't. Uh, we yeah. We don't uh, have the equity in our home. I wish we had. But I mean, it's that's yeah. Our generation got lucky. This next generation. I have three sons. One lives in Sherbrooke, Quebec. He went out there to to go to university and. End up staying there, but one of my sons moved to Maple Ridge because of home values. One moved to Kelowna because mm. of home values. They they, they got in the market, but uh, yeah, it's. I wish that's why I think we we need to make make those changes so that kids that grew up in Poco can stay. And you know, those are when you have those. Like we almost had a, a, an affordable home ownership plan. Um, a, a development company was doing down at Harbor, just on Harbor Street, just uh, Mary, uh, on uh, Pitt Road in the bypass, just off there. They were doing. They wanted to do. Uh, Townhouses, apartments, and a and a small um, commercial uh, a mall at grade level there, and they got the zoning change and stuff. Then they sold the property and, and left town. But um, uh, and that's not a criticism of the del developer. I don't know what happened there, but uh, they had this great plan, and a part of, a part of that was affordable uh, home ownership. And they had a program doing the, the, some of the criteria. You had to have grown up in Poco, mm. right? You had to have a history in the city to be able to qualify to live there. So because the one I know the one in uh, one of the ones in Port Moody where it was like 50 units or something, they had over 200 qualified applicants for that. So it's it's a popular item if you can do but, it. No, for sure. I, I appreciate your passion in, in driving that. So I, I personally, thank you for that. No um, so, so we got to go real quick. We're, getting, yeah. we're wrapping up, but yeah. uh, bullet questions or speed questions, SkyTrain in 30 seconds or less. Yeah, uh, well, it's it's finally on the 10-year plan to come down to downtown Poco, and I think it'll be a game changer for uh, for the city and for the downtown. I mean, it, it's not all good what it brings, but it we certainly need it because uh, you want people out of the cars, you want people, and you, SkyTrain's the way to do it, right? So... Well, Wano, thank you for coming in. It always feels like 30 minutes just goes so quick. Oh, there, there's, yeah. I got a book of things that we could talk about for another <laughs> 30 minutes. So uh, you're always welcome to come in and, well, thanks, uh, and all the best talk to on October 15th. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. appreciate everybody taking the time today to, to do this work. Thanks for coming so. in. That's Councillor Glenn Pollock, who's running for re-election in the city of Port Coquitlam. Uh, if you see Glenn around, uh, walk up and say hi. He's a very friendly guy. He's almost everywhere. Uh, well, everywhere I am, so I'm, and I'm everywhere. So uh, this is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. Thanks very much for watching.